welcome to the Navigators uh, Bible class. We are currently studying in uh, Revelation. We just started last last week. That was our first one. Okay. Uh, and uh, last week we looked at the importance of studying the book of Revelation. Uh, there's a number of um, <coughs> number of reasons why we should study it, uh, not the least of which is God promised a special blessing to those who would read the book of Revelation. So uh, it is important. We'll discuss more about it then. We looked at the writer, John the Apostle, and some things about his life and his experiences with Jesus. And we know in uh, Revelation 1, verse 1, uses the uh, word shortly, things that must shortly come to pass. Also in verse 3, at the last, uh, right near the end of it, of uh, the book, Jesus uh, uh, says, surely I come quickly. So the promise is uh, these things, events are imminent. <clears throat> That means they can happen at any time. There's nothing that has to happen before Christ comes to take us out of here. And we'll talk more about that later. But uh, we, talk, we, we mentioned the imminence of these events. Another reason to study. There are three divisions in Revelation. Uh, the things that John had seen in the past, the things which are now at the time of his writing, and then the things which shall happen hereafter. Very easy divisions. That's given in the book. We didn't have to do that. Um, we also mentioned that Revelation details the end or the future of many things. And uh, I added this to, to it uh, this week. Basically, everything. It lists the ends of everything. Uh, no matter what you could come up with uh, as far as a subject, the book of Revelation will bring it to an end or will tell you where it's heading, uh, the future of it. So in, in that aspect, uh, the book of Revelation has the answers that many are searching for today. We read it, we study it, God will teach us from it. We talked a little bit about the problems in studying Revelation. One is that people avoid it. Don't know why. Maybe they've heard that it's too hard, you can't understand it, or uh, for whatever reason. I have heard preachers say that they will not preach from Revelation because it's too controversial or too um, subject to uh, misunderstanding. One of the problems is uh, the uh, symbolism versus realism. Some things that it talks about, you say, is that symbolic or is that really uh, what it is? We'll be getting into that. But there is no scripture anywhere that we cannot understand because if you know the Lord, you have the teacher living in you. And he's the one that will teach you that. <clears throat> Jesus said, when the Comforter is come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. That's a promise of Jesus. So with that in mind, we're going to uh, uh, pick up our pants legs and jump right into the water, okay? <laughs> uh, we talked about a little bit about this, but in chapter 1, verses 4 through the end of the chapter, this is John's salutation. John's salutation. And one thing you note if you just scan and read these verses is that it's all about Christ. Things about Christ, John is telling you about Him. 
And actually, John, of all the apostles, probably knew more about the Lord Jesus Christ than any of the apostles. He was close to him during his life on earth, and he was the last one that Christ gave his word to in this book. So John knew a lot about him, and he talks a lot about him in the salutation. In verse 4 and in verse 8, it mentions that Jesus Christ is the one which is, which was, and which is to come. That's also mentioned in verse 8, the same thing. Hebrews 13.5 said Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we see here, John is letting us know that Jesus is eternal. He has always been here, and he will talk about that a lot more. In verse 5, it describes Jesus as the first begotten of the dead. First begotten of the dead. And when it talks about this phrase used of Jesus Christ, it means that he died, he was resurrected, that is the body and the spirit and the soul came back together, alive, and he has remained alive and has never died. That is not true of Lazarus, whom he resurrected from the dead in John, what is it, 11? Uh, and, you know, he came forth from the tomb after being dead four days. Uh, there was a number of people throughout Scripture that were raised from the dead, but later they died. Jesus is the first who raised from the dead and never died. He is alive today. So first begotten of the dead speaks of him first. And in 1 Corinthians 15, you'll see that the importance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is the fundamental block that we build our beliefs on because he lives see uh, because he lives because he was resurrected we can look forward to the resurrection if you'll notice our chart over here uh, we see the resurrection of Christ here that the red arrow you see another red arrow here guess what that is at the end of the church age, that's the rapture of the church. That's where you, uh, when Christ comes back, if we are alive, we go up to meet Him. Our loved ones who have died in the Lord will be resurrected, and they go up to meet Him. Verse Thessalonians 4, right there. And there's a third red arrow over here. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You'll have to come back and, and uh, we'll study it together, okay? <laughs> Got to leave something. All right. <clears throat> John goes on to describe in verse 5, chapter 1, Jesus is the prince, the prince of the kings of the earth. Now, uh, in Revelation 19, verse 16, when he comes back at the second coming, which is this right here, where that thick blue arrow is on the chart, the day of the Lord, when he comes back there, he will have written on him, King of kings and Lord of lords. See? Right now he is a prince. Later he will be king. See? Now, a prince is what is referred to as heir apparent. An heir apparent is someone that will inherit the throne without any possibility of anyone else getting it. That's an heir apparent. There's another heir something that 
uh, I can't remember the word now, air, but it's not as strong as this. This is a very strong term, and no one else will have that inheritance but him. Also, prince. A prince is the son of the king. The prince is the one that will be king. And whenever you see prince in scripture, it has the idea of he will inherit. He will reign. In Isaiah 9 verse 6, it says, uh, uh, i got to start here. I can't get into the middle of it. For unto us the child is born unto us, the son is given him, grown bishop on his silver. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Almighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace. Now, if he's the Prince of Peace, peace doesn't exist now. We know that. We see it every day on our news there is no peace and um, peace will not be achieved until the Prince of Peace comes back how does one achieve peace when war exists there's only one way to get peace you cannot negotiate peace <clears throat> you cannot sit down and say well I'll give you this you give me that I'll give you can't do that. The only way to have true peace is when one side demands unconditional surrender of the other side. I think the last time that happened was World War II, uh, when unconditional surrender was demanded. And even that was watered down, but that's as close as we've ever come to it anyway. When Jesus comes back as a Prince of Peace, there will be, uh, he will conquer, and he will rule with a rod of iron. There will be peace. Okay, moving on. Also in verse 5, it says uh, that he washed us from our sins in his own blood. There are those that say the blood of Christ is not important. That's not right. The blood of Christ is what God demanded as a sacrifice for our sin. The blood of bulls and goats could not pay for our sins. They were types of what would come, and it came at the cross. The blood of Christ washed us from our sins. Okay. He put that in there, and that's very important. Uh, note in verse 6, it says, We will reign with Him. It said, He has made us kings and priests unto God. Want to be a king? Guess what? You're going to be. And also in Revelation 5, verse 10, it says, We shall reign with Him. With him. Now, who's the we in this? When we say we will reign with him, we will be the church, the body of Christ. See? We will be married to him in heaven during this time, the marriage of the Lamb. We come back as his bride and rule and reign on this earth with him. Okay. And by the way, uh, you know the parables that Jesus, uh, one of them was the parable of the talents. He gives uh, a, a, this talent to these guys and says, when I come back, we'll, we'll see how you've done with that investment. And uh, he says, you've been faithful, when he came back, so you've been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. See? So when he comes back, he will reward us by placing us in authority over places on this earth. We will rule and reign with him. Literally, 
That's not spiritually, that's not figuratively, that's uh, reality. We will rule and reign with him. Verse 7 talks about his second coming. Verse 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Now it doesn't sound like a pleasant thing, does it not? To the people that are here when he comes back. When does this event happen? Right here, the day of the Lord. And we will be with him. Okay? And these tribulation saints here will be with him. So when he comes back, those that see him realize who he is and that they are in deep trouble. Okay? Um, note this. Every eye shall see him. That's not true of the rapture. That's not true of this event right here. Every eye will not see him. We will hear his call to come up hither. And we will meet him in the clouds in the air. First Thessalonians 4. So shall we ever be with the Lord. But the, the people of the earth will not see that. See, they won't, That will not be a, uh, a public uh, thing that they can see. Now they will wonder where all these people have gone. And we'll talk about that later. Yes. You said the only time everybody will see him. Uh, were you referring to every eye shall see and every Yes, eye? verse 7. And that's, when is that? Right there. The day of the Lord, the second coming. I'm kind of So, not the rapture. They not the coming. rapture. Yeah, you're, okay. <clears throat> right. It, uh, the rapture will be a private thing only for those that know him. <clears throat> this will be a, what what the, uh, the prophet says, the great and terrible day of the Lord. See? That's a different event. And you can see what the people on earth are thinking when they see him come back. That's the second coming. Alright, let's move on. That's not all John mentioned about Christ in this chapter. Verse 8 and verse 11 both talk of his eternal nature. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. Verse 11, he says the same thing. I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Jesus is eternal. He is God. Only God is eternal. And with that comes a number of things. If he was Alpha and Omega, and he is, if he was the first and the last, and he is, if he was the beginning and the ending, and he is, and he knows the end from the beginning, and he does, that means nothing comes as a surprise to him. He is God. He sees, he has seen, he will see, that is from our standpoint, everything that happens. And not only that, he has seen it. He has seen it. And there's one other guy that we now can say has seen it beside Jesus. And that's John. The guy that's writing this book sees it as God sees it. And we'll get into some more about that. 
how that works. Uh, in verse 13, he's referred to as the Son of Man. Two titles that have Son in them. One Son of Man, the other is what? Son of God. Two different titles. They're different. Obviously, man is not God. The words are different. As son of man, that talks about the physical nature and destiny of Christ. He will reign physically on this earth, the son of man. As son of God, that speaks of the spiritual nature of God. And as such, when people believe on him for salvation, they believe on him as God. Right? Son of God. Son of man. Two different qualities. So when you see Son of Man, he's talking about things that are going to come to pass when he returns over here. Okay. His... Yes. So when you say son of God, then you mean that's happening now. Like, are you saying that the son of man is something future? No, he is the son of man. He is the son of God. But the son of man title refers to his physical activity. Um, when he was here, he was son of man. See? Okay. He was also son of God because people believed on him for salvation, but as son of man, he came to physically fulfill the law. Tap the screen. 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 Tap the See, it's interactive. Good job. That's the devil. That's the devil acting Some, Somebody is, uh, okay. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, that was your question. No, I was just going to point out. Oh, you're going to point out that we were about to lose our display. Okay. I have to remember that. That's the first time I've, I've seen that. Of course, this is the first time we're using it. Okay. His physical appearance. If you read verses 13 through 16, you'll see that this is a very majestic uh, appearance of Christ. Um, uh, talks about what he wears, what he looks like. Uh, his feet, his hair, his head, his uh, hands holding the stars and, and, and uh, uh, the two-edged sword that he holds and all this. And it says in verse 16, his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Um, I believe this is exactly how he looked on the Mount of Transfiguration. When Peter, James, and John saw him, they realized who he was. He was Son of God. He was. Um, yes? Tell you what, let's go back to the Son of Man and explain it again. Because how can he be Son of a man? Son of man. Of oh, man. He, he was not. A son of a man. He was physical in that he was born of Mary, but his father was God. He was conceived of the Holy Spirit. See? So he's son of man, son of God. Humanity from the line of Mary. <coughs> Deity from God. Hope that helped. Okay. Uh, we're going to go on. You can read this and, and see. This is what Christ looks like. This is what Christ has always looked like. Now when he was here, walking down the streets of wherever, Jerusalem and all, they didn't see that. He was cloaked, so to speak, 
as so that they did not uh, recognize him as such. Uh, you see that in Philippians chapter 2. If you read Philippians 2, you see where he was like, had a veil over him, so to speak, so people could not see this. Yes? I know you say that's how he looks, but it says his eyes were as a flame of fire. Mm -hmm. Isn't that really des describing what he can do? He can look in? It, it very well can. But this is uh, obviously a striking picture if you were to try to uh, do an artist rendering of that. Um, it's interesting that he said his countenance was as the sun. As the sun. If you'll notice in the last chapter of the Old Testament, which is Malachi 4, it talks about him as the son of righteousness, and it's spelled S U N, and it's capitalized. Son of righteousness. It's as if the sun comes up and it never sets. Um, anyway, that's his physical appearance. In verse 17 and 18, John gets back to his eternal nature. Talks about him as the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. That's his eternal nature. That's the gospel. Jesus Christ <clears throat> came. His death, his burial, his resurrection, see? That's the gospel, the good news that Paul mentioned in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. It goes on, however, to say this, and have the keys of death and hell. He has the keys of hell and death. Now that's a... Uh, that's quite a thing to say. If he has the keys to hell, then he is the one that determines who goes there and who doesn't. If he has the keys of death, then he determines who dies and who lives. See? Now, what could be more powerful than that? You see some... Um, some of the dictators of this world in the past have wanted to have the uh, the power of death over anyone that they chose. Hitler killed so many people. Stalin killed more than Hitler did. Uh, he made Hitler look like an amateur at it. And yet, nobody points to the USSR. And nobody points to the communist dictator that murdered all those people. He starved the country almost to death, the Ukraine. Uh, a lot of stuff that goes on that you don't hear. And if you don't hear it by now, you're not going to read it in, you know, history books that are being written today, they've got that stuff written out. But men have wanted the power of death over their fellow men. That's just their old sinful nature. And yet it's Christ that holds the keys of hell and death. We pray for our loved ones who are ill and God, through our prayers, answers them according to His will. Why do we pray to Him? Because He has the keys to death. See? And um, we know people that have, we believe through our prayers, we prayed for them. They continued, God healed them, and they continued uh, to go on. We have a, a friend in Canada, Jack, what's Jack's last name, hon? Uh, and, and he's a preacher, and he's lived five, six years, 
after they told him that he would not live. And he continues to live and has, uh, has the prayers behind him. And he's had quite a ministry and continues. Jesus holds the keys to hell and death. And in verse 20, it says he has the churches in his hand. Verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. It's interesting, God explains what he meant in the verse in the previous verses that he has the churches in his hand that's those that are living during this time in the church age he has in his hand we're going to see some more about that a little bit later uh, as we get into chapters 2 and 3 but it's it's interesting if we're in God's hand who can mess with us? Um, John says, uh, no man can pluck us out of his hand. See? And that's where we are. You want to be secure? You want to be safe? <clears throat> be in Christ. See? Amen. Yes. Um, when he talks about the churches in his hand, is he talking about the tribes? The, the, no, 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 no. He talks He's about, talking about those that are believing during this time right here. We don't get into the tribes of Israel until. Uh, is that is later. that what he's talking about in Revelation? The tribes? Yeah, we're not there yet. Oh. <laughs> the churches are these right here. Okay. Okay. All right. We will get into that. Okay, John gets the command to write. Uh, first of all, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Do you know where the Isle of Patmos is? Okay. Um, Patmos is a little island. It's shaped like kind of like a little crescent like this. It's about 30 miles off the shore of Turkey, Asia Minor, and he was uh, exiled there under the reign of Domitian, uh, the, um, the Roman Emperor. And um, he was there until 96 AD when Nerwa in E. R.V.A. I believe his name was uh, got to be emperor and he was emperor for a couple of years and then he was gone but John was what do you say parole <laughs> uh, he, he was taken off the island of Patmos and then went to uh, Ephesus and uh, uh, began to teach some young men this is after he wrote the book of Revelation because he wrote it before 96 AD because he was on the Isle of Patmos when he wrote this book. Uh, one of his students, I don't know if you ever heard the name Polycarp. You ever heard the name Polycarp? He was later known as the, I think, Bishop of Smyrna or something like that. He was a uh, he was quite a, a believer, quite a, quite a Christian. Eventually he was uh, uh, martyred. Uh, but he was one of John's students. But John was on the Isle of Patmos in one of the Grecian Isles, I guess. Yes? How long was he on there? Excellent. I don't know when he went there, but we know when he left. He left there. He left Patmos in 96 A.D when the other Roman emperor came. He wanted to kind of, I guess, change things. And he lasted two years and somebody changed him. <laughs> anyway, so that's, uh, that's where he got the command to write. We have a very interesting thing here that I wanted to deal with this morning. 
John's transportation forward in time in verses 9 and 10. This is more than a vision. Look at verse 9. It says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. In other words, he preached Christ, got put in jail, basically. Okay? Um, then in verse 10, says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now when's the Lord's day up here? Right here. He was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He is brought forth in time. You see that also in chapter 4, verse 1, um, verse 2. Immediately I was in the Spirit. Behold, the throne was set in heaven. He was in the Spirit, and he looked around, and wow, I'm in God's presence. That's where he was. He was taken from this earth into the presence of God. And God dwells in eternity. No separate past, present, and future. All one. And so he is able to see stuff as God sees it. So he witnesses everything that you read about in the book of Revelation. And God says, write it down. Write down what you have seen. And he puts it in paper, and that's what we have right here. He was not the first man to see this. I believe the Apostle Paul saw it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when they stoned him outside of, I can't remember the city, Lystra? Derby, Derby, I forget one of those cities. They took him out and stoned him and left him for dead. They thought he was a goner. He was dead. No pulse. You know. And uh, and then Paul says, I couldn't tell if I was in the body or out of the body. I, I couldn't tell. But I was caught up to the third heaven. That's where God is. The third heaven at a place he referred to as paradise and saw things there. I believe he saw the same thing John saw, but God wouldn't let him write it down. Don't write it down. But John was there, and he was commanded to write these things down. It was more than just a vision. He experienced this event right here in chapter 4, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. He experiences Jesus saying, come up hither. Boom! There he goes. Wow! And then when he's up there, he looks back and sees all this stuff. And God says, write it down. And we have it. Okay. Uh, the command to write is in verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. So we got the context of John and his writing and his commission to do this. Uh, by the way, in verse 20, God begins to explain what John saw. We mentioned that a little bit earlier, and we'll see more of that throughout the book, where he sees something, doesn't know what it is, and uh, God explains to him what it is. Sometimes we can read Scripture. We don't know what it is, but if we keep reading or read somewhere else and compare Scripture with Scripture, then we begin to get understanding. God's book, the Bible, explains itself. The Bible is its best commentary. Okay. okay. In chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, we find a section that is very interesting. 
Uh, and we're going to summarize these two for you really quickly. Um, it's uh, letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Uh, it says Asia, but we know it's Asia Minor, which is Turkey. And these seven churches, uh, he writes the, these letters to. There were seven local churches in John's lifetime <laughs> in these three chapters. They were <coughs> Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, uh, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches that existed in John's time. And he said, write, write this down. <coughs> write these letters down. Seven local churches. 96 A.D. Okay? The second look at these letters, these seven letters, are seven periods during the church age over here. Seven periods during this church age. We have the, Ephes the Ephesus period, okay? the Smyrna period, the Pergamos period, things that happened in there. During the and we are in the Laodicean period right now, the last church period, we're in it. And uh, um, so I, I, I'm not going to go into it right now. By the way, how many of you were here when we did the series on the seven churches? Okay, uh, so we don't want to really get into it totally in depth because we've already done that. I may pass out a few uh, uh, sheets on it and give you, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on these seven churches. A little time, not much. The third one is that there are these are seven warnings to believers living during this time. Seven warnings to believers living during this time. He says, do this. He says, don't do that. And he says, if you don't do this, or you do do that, then this is going to happen to you. Okay? That is a specific thing aimed specifically at them. And we will see that as we get into it a little bit. Now, these are guidelines for these two chapters. I, I guess you know this is still introduction. <laughs> These guidelines are seven messages from Christ, and they are addressed to the angel of the church. You see, each one of these says, to the angel of the church of so-and-so, write these words. And a lot of people are coming, what in the world is an angel? Some people say, well, that's the pastor of the church, <laughs> or the leader of the church, or if you're speaking of the... Uh, the church periods, it's the most influential person during that church. And I've read, I studied, I looked at what different men had to say about it. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Jesus gave this message to the angel of that church. And they got it. Okay? It could have been an a, a, you know, a uh, angelic being. We're not sure. It doesn't bother me. Moving on. Uh, the message is addressed to the local church itself. The one at Ephesus, the one at Smyrna, the one at, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It was addressed as a group. And the warnings are to that particular group, not to the individuals. In other words, he says, hey, with this church, you better do this, or I'm going to remove your candlestick. I mean, your church is just going to kind of dissolve. And you see that happening today. Have you ever seen a church that uh, was really active? Yes. And then 
you know, a few years later, where'd they go? Huh. Hello. Uh, that's kind of like what we see. We're running out of time. We're going to pick this up next week. But we're still introducing stuff about these churches. We will not spend a lot of time on the churches. Uh, we will uh, go probably uh, into chapter 4 by then. We'll read chapter 2, chapter 3, and we will cover those next week. And then we will begin to get into chapter 4, the things which are hereafter. Okay? Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this book. We thank you for your promise that you would bless us if we read it. We know that if we study it, that you will bless us even further. Help us to realize that it is from you and that it is important. Bless the service following in Jesus' name. Amen.